started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar today. Um, my name is Nawal Burrell. I'm with the Madera Coalition for Community Justice. With me today is Karen Pellinelli, the Chief Executive Officer of the Madera Community Hospital, and Dr. Simon Paul, uh, the Madera County Public Health Officer. I will be the moderator for the webinar this evening. So this meeting is the first of our five part webinar series on the Madera Community Hospital. Before we begin, let me state some ground rules. Um, we will be starting by interviewing Ms. Pellinelli and followed by um, Dr. Paul. Okay, so halfway through this webinar, we will begin taking questions from attendees. Those attending can participate by posting questions in the Q&A section, or you can raise your hand at the end of the, se the session and we can unmute you. Um, so that being said, we can get started. Um, Ms. Pellinelli, first question is, or the first couple of questions are for you, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so the hospital finally shut down its doors in January 13th. Take us through from closing till now. Okay, well, thank you. First of all, I wanna say thank you for having me here tonight. I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of this. And I do wanna start uh, by just saying that it's uh, been the most difficult thing for the hospital to shut its doors after 51 years. And it's, you know, it's been difficult for the staff, the doctors, uh, you know, the board, the community, it's been difficult for everyone. And I want to just start by saying thank you to all of uh, the support that we've had over all the years, not just from the community, but from our doctors that served this community for a very long time, for all the staff that has worked, but especially, you know, the staff that worked the last three years uh, of the pandemic. It was a very difficult time, but this is very, very difficult as well. So yes, it was, it's been a difficult time for us. Uh, we did file, I, we did uh, close our doors inside of our hospital on the 30th of December and uh, we closed our clinics on um, January 10th. So um, since that time, you know, we worked very hard to try to, after the affiliation uh, fell through, uh, the affiliation we were working with on, with St. Agnes, you know, we, um, worked really hard to try to find an alternative pathway to keep our doors open and we're not able to be successful in doing that and ultimately ended up closing our doors. Uh, during that time, we also talked to many different partners to try to see if there was a, a different route to get uh, our hospital back open by finding a new partner, but we were not able to be successful in that as well. And so our last, the probably last few months, we've just been very busy doing those types of things and just, uh, you know, doing all the requirements, lots of paperwork to, to close down a hospital, regulatory requirements, just lots of, lots of busy stuff that kept us very, very busy. We did file uh, chapter 11 on March 10th. And, you know, since we filed chapter 11 and before that, it was a lot of work, you know, because we, we closed so suddenly, it was a lot of a lot of work to get prepared to even file for a chapter 11 bankruptcy. So we've spent a lot of time doing that. Did file on uh, March 10th. And since that time have been working very, uh, very hard with uh, the, uh, the attorneys, our board, and just, just going through that chapter 11 process, which is new for all of us, of course. Uh, and just, you know, keeping ourselves open for any opportunity that we can uh, get to reopen our hospital with a new partner. Thank you. And just as a follow up, um, what staff or buildings are still in operation at the moment? So we've pretty much nobody is inside the hospital, uh, the big hospital as it remains uh, today. We've all moved out into the outer buildings. And so there's not very many staff left and the staff that are there, uh, we, all, we actually have two buildings that we're in right now, but by, the, by next week, we'll all be in one building. Uh, and that's the the annex building so there's not a whole lot of uh staff left here and uh, we're trying to to conserve energy energy cost uh we are you know keeping ourselves all in one area thank you so back in january there seemed to be a lot of talk about reopening the hospital um has this optimism changed changed at all well, I'm always optimistic that that will happen. And I, I really, you know, you know, we all want that, of course, right? everybody on this call wants that. And, uh, you know, nobody wants it more than our board and myself and, uh, you know, the community. So, and our doctors. 
And uh, so I, I stay optimistic, you know, we're always open and, uh, you know, willing to meet with anybody that has, uh, you know, interest in our hospital and purchasing our hospital. So I stay optimistic. I'm glad. Thank you. So in the news, there was mention that there was some potential suitors out there. Without disclosing any names, are there any viable buyers currently out there? We don't have a buyer right now at this point, but we do from time to time uh, get people that have interest and ask for information and you know we engage with them and we'll continue to do that. And so uh, we hope that, you know, again, we all want to see this hospital open again. And any, any potential suitors that come forward, we're, you know, we're there to help them and give them the information they need to help them make a decision. Perfect. So is there any possibility that St. Agnes would even reconsider um, their offer or making an offer? I wish I could answer that question, but I really can't speak on behalf of St. Agnes. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, understandable. Understandable. Thank you. Um, I know that the Madera Community Hospital recently hosted a meeting with state officials. Can you share some of the key discussion points? Yes, we did. And we were so thankful to have them here and show them around our hospital. But first of all, we started and we toured them throughout our hospital. Uh, they came on our campus. They got to really see our beautiful campus and hospital. And we really just talked about our hospital the last 50 years, what we've been doing how the pandemic affected our hospital uh, negatively, financially, and uh, you know where we wanna go, what we wanna do. Uh, we asked for help. Uh, we just told them that, you know, how important this hospital is for the community and what we do here in this community uh, for the last 51 years and what we wanna continue to do. So really it was an outcry from, from us for help and just to make awareness of the importance of our, um, our hospital here in our community. Thank you. And then um, have there been any conversations with the Attorney General's office ever since St. Agnes declined to go forward? We have had some contact with the Attorney General's office and um, you know we we reach out to them if we if we do have a potential partner of course we will uh, go through the process again with the Attorney General. Uh, they've been very, very willing to get on a call with us and being open to, you know, answering our questions. And so we've been grateful for that communication that we've had. Great. And then on a scale of one to 10, what is your opinion on whether the hospital would reopen or not? Well, like I said, I'm forever going to be optimistic about this because I want this hospital opened. Uh, but uh, it's hard to put it on a scale of one to 10. I'm just saying right now, as we sit today, we don't have anybody here to buy our, our hospital or purchase it. But I do, I'm very excited about the new AB 412 that recently, I think we're still waiting for the governor to sign. I haven't heard that he signed it today, but hopefully soon. And I'm very optimistic with that new uh, AB 412 that perhaps some partners may come forward to entertain the idea of, uh, you know, purchasing our hospital. So we all need to stay optimistic and continue to, you know, voice our support for the need for this hospital in this community. Yes, I agree. So what do you, what do you think would be the timeline if, you know, if we did, you know, get the process started to reopen, what would that timeline look like? Well, and, um, Again, I'm just speaking, yes. I've never <laughs> had to reopen a closed hospital or be a part of that, but I do know what goes in regulatory wise and reopening a hospital or just opening a brand new facility, although I've not done that either. But I would say it would probably take about up to about six months. It could take longer than that. There's a lot of things and factors because there's so many different agencies that are involved with reopening the hospital and getting it relicensed and you know, resurveyed and making sure that we have the doctors and the nurses and the staff and all the equipment. And it really depends on, you know, what happens with the hospital. Uh, we've been now closed, it's going on five months. And as things progress longer, if, you know, we no longer have equipment or we don't have, you know, you know, the ability to reopen up, then that would affect, you know, how long it would take as well, so. Thank you. So, 
what about if there's no buyers? Um, when would the hospital be completely shut down? It's a very difficult question to ask. And um, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to, you know, all really pay close, close attention to is that we are in a chapter 11 bankruptcy and time is really as the essence. And if somebody was interested in our hospital, they would need to come forward and we need to make things happen quickly because there's only so much time during the, the chapter 11 bankruptcy process and, you know, so much money to continue on. So it, it, it does cost money to continue on. And we want to try to, you know, minimize that as much as we possibly can. And so it's hard to put a date on that, but I would say that, you know, time is of the essence and really, you know, we need, we need something to happen. And so this, this AB 412 is very timely and we're very grateful of the work that Senator Caballero and uh, Assemblywoman uh, Sori has done to help get this. And so we're, we're very happy and uh, we hope that that will bring some potential buyers to our, uh, to our doorstep. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your answers. Um, we now have some questions for Dr. Paul. Um, give me a second. So, uh, what are the trends you have you have seen in the provision of health since the hospital closure? Yeah, that's a question we get asked a lot. And honestly, I think the comments and things on your website sort of summarize the changes that we're seeing. But a lot of them are very hard to measure. A lot of things that people think we would be able to measure and see a difference in, I don't think we will. And that's kind of the minutes count stuff. Ambulance response times have stayed the same. Uh, but the biggest impact, I believe, are going to be things like the person who would have gone to the emergency room quickly now delays it two or three days and shows up very sick in Fresno. And that's very challenging to measure because it's one emergency room visit in Madera, and now it's one emergency visit in Fresno. It looks like things have worked out, right? But the fact that it's three days later, there's no way to get that data. Uh, and the fact that the person is much sicker, eventually you'll see data like that. But what it is, is that the person will have more complications from their diabetes, their heart failure, whatever it is over the next year or so. Not that they're going to do worse with this hospitalization. Yeah, they went to the hospital later. Maybe they wouldn't have got hospitalized in Madera when they went early, but now they are hospitalized. They get out of the hospital, but of course their illness is worse. And then there's other stuff that people talked about. Um, you know, what about getting specialists and people with resources? Many already went to Fresno for the specialists. People who can figure out our healthcare system will still go to Fresno for specialists, but a lot of people that's going to fall through the cracks. And that's the other kind of thing that it's, you don't see an immediate measurable impact, uh, but it really has a significant impact on people's health over the next, you know, one, two, three, four years. So there aren't easily measurable outcomes that we can say, oh, this changed by 50%. But everywhere you look, you can see that it's going to have a big impact on people's health over the next year or two. Definitely. So as a follow-up to that, Madera Community Hospital saw around like 6,500 patients, right? What's happened to them? Where, where um, are they being treated? Like, where have they gone? I think that's the number you're talking about is from the rural health clinics. And Karen knows that better than I do, but it's a lot of patients. And there, we're lucky that Cam Rain is working to pick up the slack and transfer some of those providers and many of those patients into their system which is great because if we didn't have that, those people would be basically out of care and looking for care in another county. On the other hand, that's an incredible challenge for Camarena's system to absorb that many people, even if they absorb the doctors and talking with the physicians there, right? They're getting a lot of patients who are new to them who show up with you know, 200 pages of medical records for their initial appointment, or they're showing up for that appointment without their 200 pages of medical records. And you're trying to figure out what they need. They need referrals to specialists. They need complicated medical regimens refilled. So there's a big bottleneck right now. Uh, and I think a lot of people get frustrated and fall out of care. But over time, they can get into, into appointments in Camarena or other providers may start to pick up <clears throat> outpatient appointments. You know, frankly, there's more viable financial models, I think, for outpatient care, like the federally qualified health centers than there are for inpatient care. So I think you know, what I've said before is the two extremes, the people in primary care 
will eventually be able to get into primary care. Yeah, it's not gonna be easy and people are somewhere gonna fall through the cracks. And the people who are the sickest, sickest, you know, instantly calling 911, those people will still get care. But there's this big group in the middle who are sick, not sick enough that they're calling an ambulance immediately. And that's where you're really gonna see the biggest, the biggest impact. So when, when a hospital closes, um, the State Department of Healthcare Services usually requires the Medi-Cal managed care providers to develop a transition plan, network documentation and notices. To your knowledge, was that done at all? Yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of time with it closing more rapidly than people expected, but they are all and have had to report how are they going to deal with this as far as how are their patients going to get care. The problem is they don't have a lot of great options either, right? So the answer for where they're going to get hospital care is in Fresno. They can't build a new hospital to provide, to replace Madera community hospitals and insurance companies don't buy and run hospitals, right? So they've worked and are working to promote their transportation lines to help people get to appointments. So, and that's one thing we promoted through the health department is how to get to the, like the nurse advice lines for those, for the different insurance providers in the county so that people can connect with their insurance. And the other big piece is if you don't ins have insurance and can get it, the sooner you can do that, the sooner you can sort of start to get help with some of these things and try and stay out of needing to go to the hospital, the emergency room. So yeah, they have to report how their enrollees, how their patients are going to get care. And they've done that. But the frustrating part is that doesn't recreate what, we, what we've lost, right? Yeah, definitely not. In, in your personal or your professional judgment, what would you, what would be the negative impacts resulting from this? The lack of um, this, the transition plan, the network documentation notices, what are the negative impacts? Oh, uh, I don't think the problem is with the plan. I think the problem is there's no good plan, right? <laughs> like, yes, they can offer transportation services. So you can get to all your specialty appointments in Fresno, but as everybody who's worked in healthcare knows, on paper, that plan sounds great, but when practically someone tries to call up and get transportation to their appointment in Fresno, unless you're pretty adept at managing this and can call a couple of days in advance and wait around and what if your appointment runs late and they're not able to pick you up anymore, you got a backup plan for that, right? So a lot of these plans, that's the only plan there is, but they are not in any way gonna solve all of, all of everybody's problems. You, you, you know, like I said, they can't replace, they can't create specialists in Madeira. So their answer to, I mean, there's still some, and we're again, Cameron has helped out with picking up some of the specialists as well. But if the only specialist in Fresno is in Fresno, then the insurance plans plan is to send somebody there. And that's just not a good plan compared to having those people in Madeira. And has the county tracked reoccurring patients who have to be transferred to those other providers or patients who still need to change to specialists from the after the hospital specialty care unit closed and those also who have yet to change um, primary care providers after the three primary care clinics closed? Yeah, those numbers are, I mean, basically the data you want is from Camp Marina and from the hospitals, and we don't have direct access to that data. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't have that data available. And then uh, we're over, uh, we're over four months down the road uh, with the hospital being closed now. Are there measures that you would recommend to address some of the issues? Um, you mean with the hospital continuing to be closed and being in the situation we're in, yes. uh, that's super frustrating because the other piece to this is one part of the problem is everybody here has to go elsewhere for care. The other half of the problem is, and the sites in Fresno are swamped, right? So there's two parts of the problem. So how can we help people here get the care they need? And those are the things we've been doing. Try and get people to, you know, don't get frustrated. Make the effort to sign up with your primary care provider. Make sure your insurance doesn't lapse, your Medi-Cal, so that you don't fall out of care. Know about going to an urgent care early so you might not have to go to the emergency room. That's all going to help some, but that's not going to replace the hospital. We're also advocating for, you know, and when that you talked about, you're asking uh, Karen about when the state came down to visit, they visited Madera Community Hospital. They also went down and visited hospitals in Fresno. And it's just, stunning 
when you go from a well-equipped, nice hospital is empty to a hospital is bursting at the seams. And it's like, why is this, you know, the situation is just so, it's like ridiculous that this hospital is sitting empty when they're so overwhelmed in Fresno, right? But so then the other part is, yeah, you know, Fresno hospitals may need more resources or somehow help expanding so that they can handle, you know, a larger patient load. There was a feeling that after, you know, that this was because of COVID and numbers would go back down after COVID, but that really hasn't happened for whatever reason, whether it's delayed care, um, bigger population, I don't know what it is, but the hospitals are staying full, full over capacity in Fresno. And same with specialists, right? Like it's, yes, the plan is for you to see the specialist in Fresno, but they got a big waiting list and you're not going to get in there quick, right? Um, and again, we're lucky that Cameron has been able to keep some of the specialists in Madera County because without that, they would have left. And what should patients who need that specialty care do? Both um, Camarena Health and St. Agnes are telling them that it would take roughly around three months for them to get an appointment. Yeah, you know, and that's, that's the reality, right? It, there aren't enough appointments. So um, and one thing to remember is no matter what anybody says about hospitals being full, ambulance times, they still respond quickly. If somebody is sick, you know, if you have an emergency, call 911. That is always true, right? So if somebody's very sick, don't think I can't get to the hospital. If you need to call an ambulance, you can call an ambulance. You will get the care you need and it will be timely. They won't be driving around for hours. So if somebody is super sick, that is always the answer. But as far as somebody needing to get into a nephrologist or a cardiac, you know, appointment, that's not easy to do. Primary care providers can a lot of times tide you over. If you're plugged in with a specialist before, they'll say, you know, we can refill your medicines until you get to the next specialist. Uh, if you can't get in to see anybody, that's where urgent cares can be helpful. Urgent cares aren't helpful for things, you know, that require an emergency room, you know, scans or surgery or things like that, trauma. But urgent cares can evaluate you now if you can't get into see a physician and you're out of all your medicines and you're having symptoms because you're out of them, that's a rapid way to get some care. And again, the urgent cares are also going to be <laughs> overflowing because and there too, Camarena help by increasing their urgent care hours. It's not a replacement for an emergency room, but it is a stopgap for while you're waiting to get into your primary care doctor. Uh, the other thing too is to, if there's a way to sort of manage to stay on your medicines and things like that. So you don't get work because people get frustrated. And I've seen that in patients of my own who've, you know, I've seen for one thing, they're, they were going to these clinics for other things and they're frustrated and they can't get an appointment. So they're like, oh, I'm not having symptoms. I'll just stop these medicines. Anything you can do to sort of avoid falling into that trap makes it less likely that you'll end up in an urgent care or in the emergency room. And I, I know you mentioned, um, you know, having to take EMS to Fresno, correct? Have you monitored the place and distance standards for Medi-Cal patients? Referring to like travel to and from, uh, especially by emergency medical services. The data that I know is the EMS data, which is the response times for ambulances. Uh, and that's been stable. It hasn't changed with the hospital closure. The EMS system is very good at adapting. That's they like to respond to emergencies, so it's sort of their specialty. Uh, the data is complicated, but again, there. The other thing to EMS is it's very clear what resources are needed, right? Like ambulance response times start to go up, you need more ambulances, and they need paramedics and EMTs to run them. So they monitor that closely. They've had a plan that's worked very well. If the Madera ambulances are full, they move ambulances from Fresno into Madera in case there are more calls that there's ambulances to respond. When the hospital emergency initially closed, they posted an ambulance there in case people showed up there not knowing it was closed, so they'd be able to deal with that as well. So, um, so my sense is obviously the transport times are longer and that can keep people, uh, keep ambulances out of service for longer, but that they know well how to adjust for. And like I said, so far the response times have been pretty stable since the closure. Thank you. And do you know if anyone has talked to Calviva and Blue An or Anthem Blue about maintaining an adequate network when no in-network providers are available? Um, yeah, well, again, 
they have to provide services for their patients. So they have to have a plan for that. And if you can't get in, if there's no in-network provider, they provide you or whatever authorize you to see an out-of-network provider. Um, but I, basically I would say talk with them a bit more like what we've been working on them is, uh, like I said, partly making sure people enrolled and making sure people know their resources for transportation, for um, uh, nurse advice lines and things to keep people into care. As far as their network, they work on that. Like I said, whether it's for hospitals, specialists, or even primary care, they have to explain how they're going to have access for their patients. Uh, and I've known that for the specialty care that I provide when we've had insurance companies that didn't have a provider, then you can get them to approve an out-of-network provider, which in that case was me, but it's not a simple process to do. You know, you need a case manager to help you navigate that kind of complicated uh, prior approval process. Definitely. So would you be in support of a navigator service to facilitate access to services for those who are the most marginalized in Madeira? So low income, non-English speaking, low healthcare literacy, no Wi-Fi access, limited phone access, no reliable transportation, uninsured or underinsured, et cetera. Some, some of these people don't know who to call, where to go, or even what to do. Yeah, well, you know, again, if you have medical insurance through Medi-Cal, there's their advice lines, transportation lines, and they usually have actually fairly helpful customer service lines. So if you have Medi-Cal, you can call the number on the card to get through to your customer, whatever they call it, helpline, and they will help you navigate those problems. That sounds great, but again, part of the problem is yes, they provide transportation, but scheduling transportation, dealing with that is much harder than going around, you know, half a block or half a mile to see a provider that's in your area. So if you have in Medi-Cal, those are the resources, the best resources to be using because they will get you to the ones that are covered uh, and to network providers and things like that. Um, for other things, it gets to be complicated what you're navigating people with. You know, people have mentioned things like patient transport, but that's a whole, you need to be a licensed medical transport person um, because there's a lot of issues about safety and things like that. So providing medical care or getting into that or determining who needs transport and what level of urgency is, is complicated to provide. Um, but as far as helping people navigate the system, yeah, we've been doing that by, like I said, trying to get information out. The other thing we've been doing is using the mobile vans from the Department of Health to both help people know what's going on. And that's, like I said, if somebody's run out of the medicines, we can check their blood pressure and tell them, yeah, it's way too high. You need to go to an urgent care and not wait three months to get into primary care. Uh, if they're out of their medicines, you can help them sort out. Perhaps it depends who's staffing the van, whether they need to be going to an urgent care or what they need to be doing to stay on their medications, which helps navigate some of the issues you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's what the insurance companies provide. We're trying to fill in some of the gaps and some of them are more complicated to provide for, for navigation services. Noel, can I add something? Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to say, you know, we did update our website since we have been closed with our community physicians that are here locally that uh, could possibly take some patients. I just want to mention it because sometimes I do believe it is difficult for people to get to find, you know, specialists, especially, you know, we developed our specialist clinic many years ago because we saw the great need uh, for specialists in our community, because it's not easy, first of all, to refer them outside of the county lines. And secondly, you know, like you said, for people with transportation. So I just want to mention that we did update our website to make sure that uh, you know, uh, people could see that and the community physicians that are here, because we have some great doctors here of our, of our community. And um, I, I agree with you that more work needs to be done uh, to make you know, the navigating around healthcare more easily, uh, you know, accessible to the community. And I, I think there is a great need. And, and, you know, even when you talk about CMSP or a CMSP, it's very difficult to refer those patients because many of the doctors and the specialists in Fresno do not take uh, that insurance. So 
I don't have the answers, but I think the health plans, you know, we need to work with them more uh, to get, you know, to get more help. Um, it's not easy. Thank you. And then um, before we go to the audience, uh, Dr. Paul, do you agree with Ms. Palinelli's ass assessment of the future of the Madera Community Hospital? Um, I'm not sure which piece of the assessment. I think there's big, it's very frustrating. You know, at one level, it's so obvious. It's crazy that this hospital is closed. There's a huge concern at the state level about equity. This is the biggest disaster for healthcare equity that's happening right now that I can see. It's a massive, massive problem. So that's just blatantly obvious on the surface. And as soon as you try and solve the problem or come up with programs, it just disappears into all of these very complicated issues. It's multiple different agencies. It's, you know, you have to have a, another medical a hospital company to affiliate with perhaps. Um, there's, you know, reimbursement rates aren't set by the state. They're set by insurance companies. It just disappears into these, these sort of huge number of problems that no one organization or person controls. You know, to me, it's stunning that uh, Soria and Caballero were able to get that bill through. I mean, that's like four or five months uh, for having money to help uh, keep hospitals open. But that's the sort of level of intervention you need is almost at the legislature level because there's no one group, person, department that controls what goes on with hospitals in the state. And it's incredibly difficult for whether it's the hospital, the county, the insurance companies, all of us would love the hospital reopened, but no one of us, no one of them has the levers to make that happen. Um, so it's incredibly frustrating. And like I said, well, you know what I was saying before is it's just, there's a lot of challenges to it. Thank you so much. All right, it is 635. So we are going to get into the Q&A portion of the night. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, this session, this Q&A session is made to be constructive. Um, we would like for no uh, negative comments or disrespectful comments to be made. Um, we're solely taking questions. So please leave your comments um, to our discussion board on our website. Uh, it is at madeiraccj.org under the MCH Q&A uh, tab, okay? So um, go ahead and raise your hand if you would like to ask a question and we will bring you uh, on as a panelist, okay? I see one hand raised. Um, okay, there we go. I was like, I wasn't sure he's, his hand has been raised for a while. We do have some questions in the chat as well. So I'm gonna read the first one. Um, it's directed to Dr. Paul. Um, the one's about EMS? Yes. There's a bunch of questions about the EMS data. The data I've seen is for priority one and two calls uh, monthly before and after the hospital closed. And the response time is averaging about nine and a half to 10 minutes uh, before and after the hospital closed. So that's the time for the hospital, for the ambulance to get to the person. And that's kind of the critical time in uh, surviving uh, basically emergencies, trauma, things like that. So that's the data I've seen. Um, but yeah, EMS can provide that data. Um, and Dan Lynch is the person who sort of coordinates the EMS system and has done really an amazing job of maintaining the ambulance response times throughout the city. Thank you. And then also um, just a reminder um, for those in the chat, we are only going to be asking the questions. So if you have any questions, um, post those ask questions, okay? The other thing too that I think it's important to say is people frequently focus on the sickest, sickest patients and ambulance response times. And I think focusing on that is a mistake because it's obviously very logical that they can solve that problem. And if we put a lot of effort into saying that is the problem, if you study it, when you get the data from EMS, you'll see, no, that's not the problem. 
And we have made no progress on getting to the much harder problem of showing where the impact is, which is with the moderately ill people, like I said, went to the hospital two or three days later, right? So to me, that's been frustrating is people always mention these sickest, sickest, sickest patients, right? But even provide, prior to Madera Community Hospital closing, a lot of those patients went to Fresno anyway. Level one trauma was Fresno. The stroke center was Fresno. So there's no difference in care for those issues. They go to Fresno, they went to Fresno before, they go to Fresno now. The huge difference are for the people who needed sort of the 24 hour stabilization, the people who would have gone to Madera Communities Hospital's emergency room because it was uh, you know five minutes away and a friend could give them a ride. They could get their heart failure, or their diabetes tuned up and go back home. Those are the people who won't call an ambulance because they're not quite sick enough yet to call an ambulance and aren't gonna go to Fresno till much later. So again, the ambulance data is important, but there's, like I said, they're very able to respond to that, to that situation, so. And then also, I know um, someone did also did um, write in the Q&A more of a statement, um, but I think it is important. There are still specialists here in town um, who do who do accept Medi-Cal. Um, it says there are a few and farther between, but there still is some. So I agree that it does need to be noted. Um, not everyone is in Fresno. There are still some here. Perfect. And then I I see some. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I got muted. Um, am I on mute? No, we hear you. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just wanted to answer that question about the specialist. And, uh, you know, some do take Medi-Cal, I believe, but it is an opportunity. It just made me think of this when they asked that question. There is an opportunity for these uh, Medi-Cal plans to contract with our local doctor so that they can, you know, afford to take Medi-Cal. The reimbursement is very low for the physicians in the community, and it is an opportunity that maybe we can keep more patients here. Um, and I know Camarina is overwhelmed with patients, but if you know they can get the same type of reimbursement that maybe you know Camarina gets, then maybe our physicians here in our community would be able to you know take more patients and see more patients. So it's just it's just a thought of something that maybe you know as a community we could work on. Thank you. Okay, and then again, if you have any questions, we can unmute you and you can ask, go ahead and raise your hand in, um, it should be at the bottom of your screen. We mostly have comments. I know some, it's not really specific, so I can't really um, speak to that. Okay, uh, we have one person. You are able to unmute. There you go. Mm -hmm. Dr. Go Paul. You can, yeah, you can talk now. Dr. Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, William Ritchie here. How are you? Good. Okay, I would like to ask you, you continue to assert there has been no delay in an ambulance response times. I've known Dan Lynch for 35 years. I've worked with him in EMS. I have very high regards and respect for him and the performance of his duty as EMS director. Are you willing to provide the transparency to show the first quarter of 2023 response times compared to 2022? to verify your assertion that there has been no difference in response times that are significant. Now that's the MS's data. I'm sure they're happy to share it, so. I'm not asking if they're willing to share it. I'm asking as you, as the head of the EMS agency in Madera County, are you willing to ask for that and to provide that data? So two things, yeah, they can provide data to me, to the community, they presented at the Board of Supervisors uh, before as well with the same data. So I don't think that's the issue at all. The no, other... no, sir, we have not seen the report. You have not provided it in black and white data. Can you provide the black and white data? And let's have a monitoring while EMS is 
responding to a chronic closure of a local hospital that's going to persist for months. I want your commitment. I want your commitment to monitor the impact on the community and the county at the response times. Yeah, we can get that data from you. Yes, I don't think that's a big deal. You have to be careful what times you compare because remember there was the surge and COVID, and you cannot compare response times during the surge to response times now. It might be better, but the other piece is, I'm happy to get that data, but why would we think it's not going to be what I said? right? Like I've seen the data from earlier. I'll ask them for the data to present, but it makes perfect sense that it hasn't changed. Okay. So, sir, I'll request it through the board, through the city council, and I called to Dan or in FOIA. But I said I would ask for the data let's, to present. Let's see the spreadsheet. Let's see the uh, spreadsheet, sir. That's right. I've said I'll ask EMS for the data so it's clear presentable. But again, I don't see why you're doubting it. They've placed ambulances to make up for the difference. It's a very straightforward problem to solve. And many of the transports, even prior to Madera Community Hospital, were to Fresno County. There are many transports from Madera Community Hospital to Fresno that no longer happen that free up ambulances. So yeah, I'll ask for that data and present the data. But I think all I'm trying to say is thinking that that's where the, we're going to find problems is looking in the wrong place and it distracts people from looking from where the real issues are. And I do think um, Dr. Paul has answered this question. So I'm going to take you back to um, the uh, attendees portion. Okay. Thank you for your participation. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, and then we do have another question in the chat. So can you talk about the status? I'm, I'm assuming this is for um, Karen. It does not specify, but can you talk about the status of the hospital license? We understand that it expires May 26th. Is the license dependent on you maintaining the Chowchilla or Amor? licenses for background, the state opposed at ending those licenses for license related reasons, but there are there was some confusion around the status of those leases. leases. So let me try to answer the question. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Um, so we do our licenses in suspense and it has been in suspense since we closed our doors and uh, we even today, we have been working on our license uh, staying in suspense. We do have a license uh, uh, renewal fee that is due on May 25th, uh, and that's what has been in question. And so just even today, I've been going back and forth with the state uh, to see how we can continue to keep the license uh, in suspense. So we're currently continuing to work on that. So I don't have all the answers right now today but it is one of the things that is at the forefront that I work on every day to make sure that we can keep that license in suspense. That's what we all want, right? We want to keep that license in suspense. Thank you. Again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or um, go ahead and raise your hand. I know, William, you still have your hand raised. Do you have another question by chance? Um, if not, go ahead and take it, lower your hand. See. Can you hear me? Okay, there you are. You have another question? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, with regards to AB 112. Who would you, uh, you, before you uh, continue, who would you like to direct your question to? To Karen. Perfect. With regard to AB 112, I think that's a very positive step by the legislature and our local rec rec representatives to address shortcomings in funding. But it is a loan. Let us admit that the contribution towards the failure of the finances for the hospital is underpayment of Medi-Cal and underpayment of commercial insurance. So if you have a business plan after a loan 
pays. How do, you, how do you survive the current financial environment if there is not a revision in Medi-Cal and commercial insurance? And I will say finally, it was reported in public media that the failure of commercial insurance has been known for a long time. So there's your question, how do we deal with that? So with the, the, AB, the AB 412, uh, it is a loan. Uh, the loan, from what I read on the transcripts, is that it could be forgivable if you stay in operations for a certain amount of time. Uh, still trying to find out more information about the AB 412, but I do believe it brings an opportunity for a partner to come in. But you really bring up a, a good point and a point that lots of people have brought up is that how does hospitals continue to survive? Because uh, the reimbursement rates are, are very low and for, you know, and they're all different for different hospitals, but it's also a challenge, you know, to change those reimbursement rates and, you know, all the different hospitals contract differently uh, with the agencies and depending on, you know, I think when you have a little bit more, you know, more hospitals, you have a little more power in the negotiations than maybe, maybe perhaps a small independent like Madeira does. Uh, but yes, that that is a concern and reopening a hospital with the rates that the, the way they are will be challenging and you would really have to look at how you reopen and what service lines that you could provide provide and you would not be able to in today's market to provide all the same services that we were providing prior uh, to the hospital closure. It just was not sustainable. Well, I think you and I agree on the same point. Thank you for your question. So sorry, I was muted the whole time. Uh, so uh, we have another question in the chat or I guess a clarification in the chat. It's asking about the leases again. Um, so Karen, this would be to you if you can answer. It says the state appeared in the bankruptcy court on May 9th to oppose terminating those leases. Do you know anything about that by chance? So I know that they are reviewing those leases right now as we speak, so I really don't have an answer to that question. Okay. And then um, for those interested, we are going to be discussing um, bankruptcy and that whole uh, ordeal with a bankruptcy attorney. So we'll give you the information for that at the end of the um, session, okay? Another question, um, uh, either one can answer, I'm not sure who this is directed to, but do you envision Madera Community Hospital becoming a training hospital for UCSF um, Medical School at UC Merced or is that a pipe dream? I mean, I can, I'll, I'll take a stab and Dr. Paul can join in as well. But of course, you know, Madeira Hospital, we would love to be able to have, you know, residents here and train uh, doctors because they're so needed in the Valley. And it, it's just a great opportunity to bring, you know, physicians here locally. Um, as far as UCSF or UC Merced uh, coming to Madeira, I did read about that in the paper. I have not spoke to them directly, so I really can't answer that. But uh, Madeira would be opened, uh, of course, with open arms to have the opportunity to work with either one of those uh, uh, great schools and bringing those kind of services here if there was an ability to reopen the hospital and they had a willingness to be a partner in that. Yeah, and I, had, I don't know if it's a pipe dream, but it's certainly a dream. You know, part of the goal of UC Merced is to improve healthcare in the Valley, and their goal is to have the students from there working throughout the Valley. Madera Community Hospital, I think, is the only hospital in the state that isn't claimed as a location for graduate medical education for teaching residents. Uh, and medical schools need a hospital to train people. So, you know, I think there could be incredible synergy between uh, medical student and medical resident training and the care that's provided at Madera Community Hospital. And it also make a huge difference for other things that have been an issue, right? It'd make a huge plus for recruiting physicians, for recruiting uh, staff to work there because those are enormous obstacles. You know, when people talk about reopening the hospital, there are four to 500 open nursing positions for Fresno hospitals. So you're competing with that. 
So if you reopen Madera Community Hospital, you have to have a job that's more attractive than working for a established hospital in Fresno County. And that's very challenging to do, especially since presumably we're going to be trying to stay under budget because of what we just mentioned, Medi-Cal reimbursement rates and things like that. So you need something to attract people. Being part of the UC system would be incredible for that. Um, so I don't know that their abilities, what they can contribute to reopening a hospital versus collaborating with a hospital, that's very complicated. But yeah, it would be incredible for the, for the area to increase medical education here for just loads of reasons. Thanks. Um, we do have a question for Karen. Um, what portion of the hospital operating budget goes towards your salary? What percentage goes to manage medical records and ensure that patients have timely access to their records? And obviously um, answer to your um, you know, comfort. Yes, um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about my salary here. I don't think it's an appropriate place, but, and I don't know that percentage. I'd have to look at it. And, uh, but, and as far as medical records, we do have uh, right now currently three staff members that are working uh, on medical records and getting, and meeting the requirements to get out records timely. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're continuing to do that. That is a requirement for us. And so we want to make sure patients have timely access to their records. Um, we have another question. If the hospital does not reopen and uh, if we could have a magic wand, what are the three things you would want to see happen in Madeira? Either can answer. I'm not sure where to start. If the hospital stays <laughs> shut, we have no hospital. What three things do we want? What we want is another hospital. The question is how to get back to that. Um, and, you know, I think through the UC system and training people would be an incredible way to what we were just talking about, try and rebuild back into a hospital, whether it starts as a full service hospital or build up to that over time. Um, you know, I think that's what's needed in this area. Any, you want to answer at all by chance, Karen? Well, I, I just can't imagine not having a hospital in the future in this community. It's so desperately needed. But I, I think, you know, one of the things that we can do is really just try to work together uh, better, I think, as a community. And all of us uh, work towards getting a hospital back here in this community and whatever that looks like in the future. But we definitely need it. Unless they, you know, even, you know, some people have talked about an independent ER, you know, it just doesn't work well because the, the hospital is so close by that they would have to transfer those patients then to for inpatient care are already so impacted that they would just go from one ER to another to wait in the waiting room, you know? So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we, you know, it's, we need a hospital in our community. You know, there are other ideas out there, right? Like there's the home hospital program, which even hospitals in Fresno are interested in as a way to unload hospitals. And, uh, and Karen's right, just a standalone ER has not been very effective because you immediately have to coordinate with a hospital and why didn't you just go to the ER there in the first place? But there are ideas like 24 hour stabilization units where you can sort of provide fluids or remove fluids and fix blood sugars much more than an urgent care can do. And if you combine that with a hospital at home program, right, you can have people who are turned around within 24 hours and go home. You can have people who they've got pneumonia, they would have needed to be hospitalized, but because you're working with the hospital at home program and it's a state straightforward problem, they don't have to go and be an inpatient in Fresno of the 10 people who need to be admitted, two or three could be hospitalized at home. And of the six or seven who, yes, they do need to go to the hospital in Fresno, maybe two or three of those can get home much sooner because you have a hospital at home program. And it also kind of like the UC idea, also is a big plus for attracting people, right? A lot of people in Madeira do not want to deal with the travel and going to Fresno hospitals. And if you thought that if you went to the Madeira community hospitals at a stabilization unit combined with hospital at home, like I'm sick, but if I go early, I might be able to be hospitalized at home instead of all the motivation being now to go as late as possible because who wants to go to Fresno? Suddenly you're attracting people to come to Madeira because if you come early, you might get to be hospitalized at home. And it's a huge plus for equity, right? Because who, who is the least wanting to go to Fresno or people who maybe within their small community and really aren't connected with 
you know, the healthcare world. And if they think they can get, stay hospitalized within their community, with their family, with people who speak their language, they also will come to the emergency room sooner once word gets out, as opposed to now, they're afraid to go. And going to the hospitals in Fresno, it's pretty intimidating. And I used to work there, right? But if you think, wow, I might be able to get care at home, you'll go to the hospital sooner. Um, and again, if it's we're still on the three wishes question, you can toss that in there for me. I wanted to mention too uh, that you know in California you can't have a freestanding ER, but that question has brought has been brought up to us no, numerous times, and I know to Dr. Paul as well. Uh, you'd have to get a waiver from the state, and I don't know if they'd even do it. And uh, we did approach it with the state, but we never really got an answer to, for it. But again, like I said, I we I, I'm not sure if that's the answer either. You know, I'm not the expert out there, but I do know that it's difficult because the hospitals are full in Fresno, and sometimes many hospitals hold a lot of patients in their ER because there's not a, enough inpatient beds. Thank you. And I know we have uh, we have time for one more question. If you have another question, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll save it um, because we do have a couple of more webinars that we will be hosting. So one last question from Sherry. I believe you should be able to speak now, Sherry. See. Are you there, Sherry? Uh, okay. Um, she needs to be unmuted. If you would like, go ahead and type it in the Q and A. Okay, Sherry. She needs to be unmuted. <laughs> yeah, it's saying that you're muted. So, um, all right, we will move on. William, uh, do you have another question that you want to ask? Let's see. Why did you block me? Say that, say that one more time, sorry. No, uh, when I was asking questions and making comments, you blocked me. Oh, sorry. When um, one has been addressed, people are dismissing them. The about the transparency about the sheets. Which people are dismissing transparency? We have a staff in the chat that will be um, once a statement is already addressed, we dismiss them. So now we only have ones that we have not touched on. On okay, there. the only person that can judge the transparency of the request that I made of Dr. Paul is the EMS agency and Dr. Paul. I think um, I think he covered that as well. So no, until the spreadsheets are provided. That well, uh, whenever that he is <laughs> Whenever he does that. No, seriously, come on. That's, that's the transparency. I, thank you. Um, any other questions though, William? Uh, Karen, I would like to ask you, you deferred your answer for your compensation. Do you really believe since the hospital has filed for bankruptcy that you can provide an operating plan to reopen MCH. You know I have spoken to the board. I objected to the advisor or consultant that you sought. And I'm very happy the board chose their consultant. So are you willing to work with Madera County's consultant and provide a result or plan for reopening a hospital, even if it is not in the, the, the name of the MCH? I'm absolutely 100% willing to work with anybody that wants to assist the hospital in getting reopened. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. 
So it is now 7.03, um, which brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, I want to thank Ms. Pellinelli and Dr. Paul for being so generous with their time and participating tonight. Um, to the participants, uh, please be reminded, we will be continuing this conversation um, next week. Thursday, I believe the 18th, we will be featuring Mr. O'Halloran. He is a bankruptcy attorney representing the Madera Coalition who will help us in understanding what is happening in court at the moment and give us the most recent developments in the case. So once again, thank you all for participating. If you have any more um, comments or questions, head over to our website. Um, I can put that in the chat. It will have it will allow you to have a um, a discussion board where you can communicate with the rest of the community, and as well as um, post your questions, and we can possibly get them to the right people. Okay, go ahead, and I believe it's in the uh, Q and A. Let me see. I can't do it actually. We'll have somebody do it. Um, but you can also go to our website. It's at madeiraccj.org. Okay, or to our Instagram at Madero Coalition or our Facebook at Madero Coalition. Thanks again for participating and we um, hope to talk to you soon. <laughs> Take care, bye now. Thank bye. you.